I feel that we are on the eve of a new era where there is to be great harmony between the federal and confederate. I cannot stay to be a living witness to the correctness of this prophecy, but I feel it within me that it is to be so. Ulysses S. Grant, 1885. The man who helped keep the Union together had to fight one last battle in the summer of 1885. Swindled by a banking investor, Ulysses S. Grant and his family were left destitute. To make matters worse, the Civil War hero and former president was dying of throat cancer. In June of that year, Grant and his family took up residence here, on top of Mount McGregor in Saratoga County. The cool mountain air, a small comfort to a man in tremendous pain. But there was no time to waste. He was closing in on finishing his long-anticipated memoirs. New York City in the summer in 1885 is a difficult place to live with the heat and all. And all. So he uh, got the offer of this cottage from uh, Joseph Drexel, who was a friend. He had this cottage up next to the big hotel, and he invited Grant up to stay. Um, they thought through the summer, or they didn't know exactly how long it would be. So he came up to uh, finish his memoirs so that he could leave a legacy for his wife and she would have some money after he was gone. Mark Twain, sympathetic to Grant's plight like most of America, gave him a generous offer to write his memoirs, a deal where Grant would keep 75% of the royalties. The nation was well aware of Grant's plight and were kept updated almost daily on his condition. There were reports in the newspaper every day all over the country. The New York Times had something, so everyone was really aware of his illness. They were following it in the paper, and uh, there would be reports every day from up here about how the day had gone, when he had been up in the night, and all those things. They would interview the doctors and things like that. They would just observe what was going on, like if the lights were on in the night. There's many pictures of Grant reading the paper, so I assume that he must have read the reports as well, which is a kind of an interesting thought. The atmosphere seemed to rejuvenate Grant's memory as the memoirs neared its completion. He was mostly done, but uh, they were, were working on the proof revisions and things like that, but then he kept adding stuff every day. And in fact, Mark Twain, who was his publisher, was up here at the cottage um, at the end of June and spent a day or two and worked with him on, on things, hoping to like, get it finished. Um, but then he kept adding more and adding more handwritten notes to the to the proofs. His voice didn't last very long. He could maybe speak a small amount each day, but he mostly would write notes. And um, we have several notes that um, he wrote. One of them says, uh, ask Jesse to come down and play cards with me. Um, his whole family was here with him. They lived on the upper floors of the cottage, which had six large bedrooms. And so his uh, three sons and their families and his daughter were all here to spend the last days with him as well as, of course, his wife. Towards the middle of July, the memoirs were complete. Finally, with some time to relax, he took in the glorious view just down the hill from the cottage. The story goes that after he finished the memoirs, he requested to come down and get what he probably realized was the last view of the Overlook. There was a large gazebo um, on one side and he would come sit there and look out. But very soon after that moment of peace, Grant quickly took a turn for the worse. And on the morning of July 23rd, Grant took his last breath here on this bed. His son Fred stopping the clock at 8.08 to mark the moments of passing. It's been well over a century since the Grant family left here, yet remarkably the cottage looks almost exactly the same today as it did in 1885. This is what was called Grant's sick room. He had two chairs and he would sleep, uh, rest sitting up and put his feet up on the other chair. And so the two chairs are there. There's also a cabinet with his top hat, some shirts, a bathrobe, um, his toothbrush. We do have in the sick room a large bottle. It's a um, cocaine and water solution that was used, um, uh, that was used for pain relief. After you look at the sick room, you go through into the uh, parlor. The parlor and the dining room are sort of one large room across the front of the house. What you see now are some of the floral arrangements. They were dried flowers um, back then, and they are uh, still displayed as they were back after uh, Grant died. In the parlor is some of the original furniture, again the original carpets, um, some lovely wicker pieces that are kind of unusual to see these days and the bed where Grant died. After uh, July 20th, he had finished the memoirs. He really was not feeling good, so he called for a bed to be brought down, and that's the bed that he died in. 
Two weeks after his death, New York City honored the American hero with a funeral procession that was seven miles long. Today, Grant's remains and those of his wife, Julia, lie in what is now known as Grant's tomb in New York City. Grant's cottage was immediately closed up and later opened as a museum in 1890, as it still is today. It really became what we would call today a shrine. People wanted to come up, they would come up and just look at it. They appreciated his leadership and his heroism and the way he had faced this um, you know, final illness. Grant's memoirs sold over 300,000 copies, netting his family close to a half a million dollars. After the general's death, his son Fred found a final note he had written 14 days before his death. It was in the pocket of his bathrobe. With the knowledge I have of your love and affection and the dutiful affection of all of our children, I bid you a final farewell. Until we meet in another, and I trust, better world.